today, at a pivotal moment in world history, two great museums beckon us to explore the splendor of Islamic art, lifting the veil on our shared cultural heritage. The objects on display in the Islamic galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Louvre in Paris reveal a roadmap of connections. This explains why the foreign seems familiar. I have dedicated my life career to Islamic art for many years now, attracted, no doubt, by the beauty. My eye was seduced by the whole culture, a culture that may look different in some ways, but at the same time is actually quite close. Universal museums like the Louvre and the Metropolitan help dispel the idea that cultures are exclusive when in fact they are intertwined. Today we live in a world that is connected and global, but our connected and global world also has a history. Islamic art is, without a doubt, more difficult to access for those who may not have any knowledge of the culture. Whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, many just don't have any knowledge of this very complicated history. The art of Islam reflects 14 centuries of changing political and cultural landscapes across three continents. So you're talking about a tremendous mix of world images, cultures, you know, and, uh, and the result that came out in the literature and the art of the Islamic world is, is very exciting. One of the glories of Islamic art is inlaid metalwork. And one of the absolute pinnacles of this technique and this type of art is the Baptistère de Saint-Louis. Created in Mamluk, Egypt, it became part of the royal collections of France. It is a basin of metal, copper alloy, inlaid with silver, that was crafted in Syria or Egypt in the mid-14th century. And this basin will be used later for the baptisms of royal children, including Louis XIII. The Mamluks were slaves trained as soldiers who overthrew their masters and then ruled an Islamic empire for 300 years from Cairo. Inside the basin, we have friezes of riders, which illustrate the court life and the warrior concept of the Mamluk dynasty of Egypt. The are scenes of battle and violence, a decapitated head and severed limbs. The interesting thing is, of course, that there was no resistance to using it for a Christian religious rite, baptism. Even though it had been made by Muslim craftsmen, it worked just fine. I think that an important thing to understand when you want to discover Islamic art is that Islamic art is not simply just an Arab art. Nor is it simply religious art. The term Islamic art, coined by 19th century art historians, includes all art produced in Muslim lands from the 7th century forward from Spain to Morocco, Egypt, the Middle East, Central Asia and India, to the borders of China. Today, we tend to think that Islam is the East. At least, that's how Islamic art is presented in Western culture. But Spain was Islamic, and Morocco is a Western kingdom. Take, for instance, the roaring Monthon lion, a cast bronze fountain spout created between the 12th and 13th centuries in Islamic Spain. In characteristic Islamic style, the surface of the lion is completely covered with engraved decorations, including Arabic calligraphy. Now, obviously, you're talking about a huge variety. You're talking about Spain to India and beyond. And everything in between has its own style, it has its own materials. And you might even say, what's common between all of this? What unites all of this? 
The most obvious connection is the presence of Islam. Muslims believe that God revealed a new faith to the prophet Muhammad, beginning in 610 AD near the city of Mecca, where the well-established Jewish, Christian, and pagan communities rejected him. He moved to Medina and died 10 years later in 632. Yet, in that mere 10-year span, Muhammad and his army succeeded in conquering most of the Arabian Peninsula for Islam. When we talk about Islamic art, everyone expects objects coming from a mosque. And I think it is important to say and repeat that Islamic art is not only a religious art, but at the same time, we also have to show in what way Islamic art is religious. Traditionally, the creative focal point for Muslim communities is the mosque. In its very simplest form, the mosque is really a structure that gives you the direction for worship towards Mecca. That's often just a simple wall with an indentation in it that indicates the direction that Mecca lies in. Over time, this indentation, called a mihab or prayer niche, became more elaborate. The brilliant blue tiles of this dazzling mihab are distinct to the Iranian city of Isfahan, the blue city. More than 600 years ago, artisans cut and pieced together tiny glazed ceramic tiles to produce the scrolling foliage and calligraphic designs of this meticulous masterpiece. These mosaic techniques were first developed in the Greek and Roman worlds. It's a little known fact that the cultures of Islam used the technical and decorative repertoire of late antiquity. As Muslim armies conquered more and more territory, local artistic traditions were blended into an evolving Islamic style. In the 12th century, Muslim artisans skillfully hammered and pierced copper to create the intricate openwork pattern of this mosque lamp. And then there is an inscription on the upper part of the ball. There is one God, and God is God, and that is what creates the first pillar of the Islamic faith. Designed to hang from the ceiling, the lamp filled the room with filtered light symbolizing the presence of God. For me, it symbolizes the foundation of Islamic art. It is a lamp that comes from the famous Dome of the Rock, built by Abd al-Malik, one of the first caliphs in the Umayyad world, in the end of the 7th century. The Umayyads are responsible for the first great monuments of Islamic art and architecture. The Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is the oldest Islamic shrine in the world, built on the site of a Roman temple. And this is a symbolic way, I think, to show that the Caliph Umayyad is the new Roman emperor of this Mediterranean world. The Umayyads set up their new capital outside of Arabia, in Damascus, Syria, an area that had long been exposed to the cultures and sensibilities of the Mediterranean world. Here, they built the Great Mosque of Damascus, which employed forms and elements of classical art familiar to Westerners, like columns, vaults, and domes. We're talking about a territory that partly overlapped the ancient Roman Empire. We, at the Louvre, wanted to reiterate the continuity between antiquity and the Islamic world. At the Metropolitan, this bronze Umayyad picture from the 7th century shows the merging of Persia's 4,000-year-old artistic traditions with a new Islamic aesthetic. And it has this long uh, handle, very elegant handle, and if you look at it, you see that it's actually a feline, perhaps some kind of a leopard or mountain cat that's elegantly stretched its whole body over to form the handle. But what is it doing? All around the rim is a goose, 
that it's chasing, it's hunting a goose. It's really the great Persian theme of hunting, which informs so much of Persian art. But the body represents a transition in taste from figural art to repetitive designs. Elaborate patterns of scrolling vines, geometric shapes or calligraphy often point to an Islamic influence. Calligraphy is a way to reproduce the written word through an artistic drawing. Obviously, calligraphy as a core component of Islamic art is not a coincidence. It is fundamentally related to the fact that the Islamic world is an entity with Islam as its dominant and official religion. Arabic calligraphy is found everywhere in Islamic art. The hull of this galleon glows with sweeping golden strokes. A closer look shows the image to be a calligram, composed of calligraphy. The writing of calligraphy was considered the highest art, more important than painting and other arts, because it was devotional and because, of course, the first thing that a great calligrapher would do would be to copy the Quran. The Quran is the holy book of the Muslims. It is the revelation handed down from God to Muhammad. It is canonical. No word in the Quran changes. They are the same words that were written down after Muhammad recited them in the seventh century. This manuscript is a Quran from the time of the Mamluk Sultanate. It was made in Egypt, in Cairo, at the end of the 14th century. The back of the book is actually the front. Arabic, like Hebrew, is read from right to left. And then we have a double opening page with a particularly elegant design. Again, with a frame to highlight all its splendor. And we have the first verses of the Quran that were copied on a delicately decorated background with plant foliage dotted with lotus buds. It's natural that a beautiful, sacred book would need to be displayed with elegance and respect. Book stands like this one, called Ralas, were the focus of artistic enterprise throughout the Islamic world. It's made from a single piece of wood that would have had to be split and separated so that it falls in the form of an X, but if you stand it up together, you can see that it was essentially formed from a single piece of wood. On the sides of this book stand, you find uh, extraordinary, very fine, very deep carving. And if you look at it closely, you realize that it's been conceived of on three different levels. You have almost secret, hidden inscriptions at the very deepest level. God's name and the sacred name of the prophet underpin everything else that you see. Sacred writing is woven into every aspect of Islamic life. The 99 names of God are stitched around the circumference of this prayer rug at the Louvre. In Islam, there is a way to evoke God through a number of names and adjectives, and they are all mentioned here. You also have many inscriptions, and that makes this rug of a high quality. It is very, very difficult to weave the inscriptions because you must be very precise, and as you know, writing is very important in Islamic art. Arabic script in the Quran was the physical manifestation of God's message. As the empire spread beyond its early borders, the Prophet's native tongue became the official language, tying religion to power and the Arabian identity. When you come to our galleries or to any museum or any place where you have evidence, objects, scholarship, you're not just told that Greek medicine was translated into Arabic, but there you have the manuscript itself, the evidence itself, with all the accurate information. 
that's the great thing about a museum. You make up your own mind about it and you've got all the tools before you to, to do so. And that is really very empowering. When the Umayyad dynasty fell to its rivals, the Abbasids, in the 8th century, the center of the Islamic world shifted east to Baghdad. And so did the seat of collected knowledge. This marked the start of the golden age of Islam. We have to keep in mind that the Islamic world served as a kind of conservatory for the knowledge inherited from antiquity. In Baghdad, the Abbasid caliphs gathered scholars to collect and translate all the knowledge in the known world. It was an epic undertaking. For 400 years, the arts and the sciences flourished. It was all destroyed when the Mongols conquered Baghdad in the 13th century. But what they achieved in that period is known as a golden age of Islam because it advanced all the things that humanity values, not just the Muslim world, but the world. These are pages from a popular medical reference titled De Materia Medica, one of the first scientific texts to be translated from Greek to Arabic in 9th century Baghdad. It was written by Dioscorides, who was a Greek who lived in what's now Turkey in uh, the early first century AD. And this was translated into Arabic and then illustrated. It's a pharmacopoeia with descriptions of about a thousand medicines made from plants. This page, on the other hand, shows men making medicine out of honey. It is through these Arabic translations that texts from classical antiquity, especially Greek and Roman, were retransmitted to the West. When we study the ways cultures converge, science often lies at the intersection. This is an Islamic astrolabe, meaning star holder, based on an ancient Greek instrument for predicting the position of the moon, stars, and other planets. In fact, some of the instruments that you see were shared technologies between Muslim and Christian sailors who would love to get their hands on these kind of advanced instruments while they were establishing trade routes ar around the world. Because everyone always wants the latest gadget, whether it's an iPhone or an Astrolab, that's, uh, it's a kind of unifying interest. The Astrolabe was refined in the Islamic world, most notably by the astronomer Al-Sufi, who described 1,000 different uses for this instrument, including the direction of Mecca for prayer. Here we have a manuscript, which is the book of the images of the fixed stars by Asufi. Now this was written in the late 10th century originally, then copied and copied and copied. This 15th century copy made 500 years after Al-Sufi's original is open to a double page showing two enthroned figures. Really what this is, is the constellation Cassiopeia. And Cassiopeia, in this book and all the other constellations, are shown in two views. The one on the right, as if seen from outside the heavens, looking down. The one on the left, as if we were looking up, seeing the stars in the heavens. Over the centuries, court astronomers updated their calculations. There's a lot of variability in the sky, and although they're called the fixed stars, nothing's fixed at all. That was part of the genius of these scientists, that they understood that, and that they were such good mathematicians that they could recalculate and recalculate over time. We must keep in mind that familiar words like algebra or algorithms are originally from Arabic. And this domination in geometry and algebra directly influences their artistic productions. The sophisticated application of geometry can be seen in this elegant vaulted ceiling from Mamluk, Egypt. This vaulted ceiling has traveled from Egypt to Europe to France in the late 19th century, but it was only recently assembled for the opening of the new halls in the Louvre Museum. 
This allows us to evoke the splendor of princely interiors that shows a finely carved stone decoration with some arabesque of plants and geometric patterns. The art of geometry cannot be denied in these 14th century Egyptian doors. We can see the complexity of the geometric pattern on which the decoration is based. This decoration is organized around what is called star polygons. These are the patterns that we can see here. Exotic woods like African rosewood and ebony were often imported at great expense from faraway lands. In these regions, wood was rare, and they were trying to utilize every single piece of wood that they had. By the Middle Ages, a thriving merchant economy and a sophisticated network of trade routes helped establish the Islamic world as the first truly universal civilization. There wasn't the idea of being a world apart. It was really a world that was connected to the wider world, and that, I think, helped facilitate robust economies um, and, you know, rich, uh, you know, opulent courts. Architecture is one of the glories of Islamic art across the Islamic world. From Spain to India, one can think of the most notable buildings in the whole world, most famous buildings, and they are Islamic. One of the most important monuments in the Islamic world is in Spain. The Great Mosque of Cordoba is considered the oldest Islamic structure in Europe and the most innovative. The early conquerors of Spain, the early Muslim conquerors of Spain, built uh, the great mosque in Cordoba. And the beautiful mihrab, the marvelous multi-layered arches with a kind of striped or ablak uh, decoration. The mosque's unique style is distinct to Moorish Iberia, where a confluence of cultures caused the Spanish lands to develop differently from the rest of Europe. The Arabs had come in the 8th century, but the Iberian Peninsula was inhabited by Christians and Jews at that point. And there for a while, people really seemed to live in peace with one another and tolerance. This courtyard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art celebrates the artistic harmonies created by these overlapping cultures. It was constructed inside the museum by artisans from the imperial city of Fez in Morocco. We wanted to create a Moroccan court because it's related to the gallery for Western Islamic art, the art of Spain, North Africa, and Southern Italy, uh, the eight centuries of Islam in Europe. And we also wanted to bring the hand of a kind of living craftsman to our galleries. The starting point for the Moroccan court was four freestanding columns from the 15th century original works of art. But everything that's carved around them, the, the stucco above and the woodwork and the tile work, is all modern and it's all been made in an appropriate style by these living craftsmen. Out of 40,000 craftsmen in Fez, the Met chose the Naji family company, run by four brothers and their father. We are seven generation in this business, but for me and for my family, it's unlike any other project that we ever undertaken, because this will serve as reference for scholars to learn more about the Islamic architecture. We were working in Morocco for almost six months, in which we fabricated all the loose tiles. The cut tile pieces were then fitted together on the floor like a puzzle, but upside down, before being set in a concrete mortar. We had to get some variation of colors. For instance, three shades of blue, there are two shades of green, so it has the characteristic of an ancient antique panel. The wood was carved in Morocco out of cedar from the Atlas Mountains of Fez. Uh, we used some of the best uh, wood carver in the city. The plaster was carved on site 
by master craftsmen who excel in sculpting arabesque or flowing vegetal compositions. Designs were laid down with stencils, then fashioned by hand using special tools. For us, we were transported back to the year 1300. For instance, the plaster on the walls, they were smoothing it with their hands. When I look at this court, I see hands everywhere. It's, everything is touched by hands. It's incredibly magical when you have artists actually working in the spaces with the art of the past. By highlighting this incredible art that still survives, we actually accomplished a great deal. We got a Moroccan court out of it, for sure, but we also um, we were able to really elaborate the idea of eight centuries of Islam in Europe and its connection to North Africa. We can indeed wonder about the place of Islamic art at the Louvre and in Western art collections. In Europe, the Islamic world was and is right here at home. The Islamic world was and is European. Many Islamic objects found in the collections of European museums were gifts from rulers or taken as the spoils of war. As far as the Louvre is concerned, and you may already know this, the museum dates back to 1793 and is a product of the French Revolution. The French royal treasury included magnificent pieces of Islamic art and became the property of the Louvre in 1793. As early as 1893, the Louvre opened a section on Muslim arts. That was the word that was used in the late 19th century. Today, the new Islamic galleries of the Louvre are marked by an undulating golden roof that conjures images of a floating veil, a flying carpet, or windblown desert sands. The surrounding neoclassical facades affirm the place of Islamic art in European art collections. One of the ways that Eastern Islamic objects came into European collections was through church treasuries. On display at the Louvre, this ewer from the Royal Abbey of Saint-Denis near Paris was carved from a single piece of very pure, very fine crystal. It's a ewer that arrived in that abbey in the 12th century, and therefore it is one of the oldest objects in our European collection. But it was created in Egypt during the reign of the Fatimids, a Shia family who claim the absolute right to rule as descendants of Mohammed's daughter, Fatima. There are seven of these in the world. A scholar calls them the Magnificent Seven. Under the Fatimids, Cairo became the cultural capital of the Islamic world. That world included the Holy Land. For 200 years, crusaders from Europe fought to take control of Jerusalem until they were repelled once and for all by the Mamluks. Then, the Mongols came calling. So this, this beautiful glass bottle with an enameled scene around it shows fighters dressed as Mamluks, so Egyptians and Syrians on the one hand, and Mongols on the other. And it's being made by the um, Mamluk glassmakers, so of course there's an edge there in favor of the Mamluks. In Islamic Egypt, the Mamluks elevated the ancient craft of glassmaking to a fine art. Their gilded and enameled mosque lamps were coveted well beyond the borders of Islam and exported far and wide. We find these objects in China, and others will travel to Europe and will influence the famous Venetian glassmakers, the glassmakers of Murano, who will eventually supersede Islamic glassmakers. In fact, Italy's close ties to advanced Islamic civilizations enriched the Italian Renaissance. This ivory box at the Metropolitan, carved in southern Italy, is a prime example of those interconnections. There are figures standing on the corners that have turbans. This is a fantastic mixture of the Romanesque style of, of carving and sculpture and images that really are related to the Islamic world.
In Islamic Spain, finely carved ivory objects, such as this one at the Louvre, were bestowed as gifts upon members of the royal family. Made from a single ivory tusk, its sheer size is exceptional, but the carving makes it a masterpiece. In 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella ousted the Muslims, completing the 700-year Reconquista of Spain, and then launched Christopher Columbus on his first voyage west to a whole new world. To the east, the Islamic Empire reached the borders of China. One of the ideas at the heart of the presentation is not to isolate the cultures of Islam, but to show that they were like other cultures, intermediaries. At the Louvre, this 13th century dish shows the influence of Chinese ceramics on Islamic pottery. So first, what is the most Chinese, I would say, in this dish is its color, this turquoise color. It was made in Iran by imitating the technique of celadon glaze. The Chinese ceramics with a single monochrome color, usually green or blue colors, began very early in the 10th century and were supposed to imitate jade. The fish and the lotus leaves are Chinese motifs, but the concentric circles of geometric patterns and elegantly stylized calligraphy ground this masterpiece in the Islamic artistic tradition. Oftentimes, pieces like these reflect a technique that was born, for example, in China, which was mastered in the Islamic lands and which was then passed on to the West, so you can see the continuity. As early as the 9th century, Chinese pottery was being exported in huge quantities, traveling along the Silk Road. Eventually, Pottery centers in Iran, like Nishapur, were producing some of the most experimental and beautiful pieces in the Islamic world. Here, dripping in browns, greens, and yellows, is the Nishapur version of the popular Chinese splashware. And this radiant white bowl, 18 inches in diameter, is the Nishapur potter's answer to Chinese porcelain. A thin coating of white fluid clay covers a red earthenware body. The black abstract design is actually Arabic calligraphy, which reads, deliberation before action protects you from regret. At the dawn of the 13th century, when this pierced jug was made, the proficiency of Iranian potters had reached a pinnacle. Technically speaking, the jug is remarkable because it has two layers. It has an outer pierced layer of vegetation inhabited by fantastic animals, such as harpies or sphinxes, so human-headed lions, human-headed birds. But this profusion of fantastic beasts was there to protect the owner. These star-shaped tiles contain astrological images of the zodiac. Here is the image of the astrological sign of Leo, with its associated planet, the Sun, in the back. And these tiles here were certainly made in the city of Kashan. The potters of Kashan were famous for delicate tiles in the shape of crosses, and the skillful execution of the metallic luster technique. The design is painted on an opaque glaze, usually white, using metal particles, mixing copper and silver. And then a fairly complex firing results in this shimmering reflection, a metallic hue that sometimes resembles gold. Ceramics of this quality and complexity required technicians and artists. And there were also calligraphers who collaborated with the ceramic workshops to achieve this type of extremely precise inscription. 
Here we have a Quranic inscription. And here, exactly in this area, is the imprint of a finger, probably of the ceramist who created this decoration. Maybe when he put it in the oven, he imprinted the mark of his finger. It's a little accident during the production, which leaves us a very touching trace from the artist who created that work. Kashan's pottery industry somehow survived the Mongol invasion of the 13th century. But traces are all that remain of medieval Nishapur, which was destroyed along with other Iranian cultural centers. Genghis Khan placed all of Eurasia under Mongol rule. So here we have a representation of Iranian society just before the arrival of the Mongols. This stucco portrait, a fragment from a life-size sculpture, decorated an Iranian palace near the city of Rey before it was raised by Mongol armies. I think it is interesting when we talk about Islamic art, we think it is a religious art and that the Quran forbids human representation. In truth, figures are only forbidden in religious art and architecture. The human figure is quite present everywhere and all the time in Islamic art. In time, Khan's successors the Il Khans, or Lesser Khans, created a new world order and placed themselves at the very center. This painting of Jonah and the Whale is based on the Compendium of Chronicles, written by Rashid al-Din, a Jewish official in the Ilhanate court. It is considered the first attempt at a true world history. Part of the motivations were in order to actually put the new conquerors of Iran into the story of Iran. So they were kind of writing themselves into world history. Jonah and the angel are shown with Mongol features, and the angel is dressed in traditional Mongol clothing. Ultimately, key Mongol rulers accepted the Muslim faith. This is one of the largest Qurans ever made. Each line of script is over three feet long, and each page was originally over seven feet tall. It was made for the brutal conqueror of Central Asia, Tamerlane, who saw himself as the rightful successor to Genghis Khan, as well as the sword of Islam. The calligrapher who copied these lines, Omar Akhtar, actually was a master calligrapher who first came to Tamerlane and presented to him the tiniest Quran you could imagine, tiny, tiny writing. Well, he presented this uh, virtuoso uh, Quran to his patron, Tamerlane, who was not impressed at all. So this could be really uh, a big problem in those days if Tamerlane wasn't pleased with you. Um, that could mean the end of your career, the end of your life, and many bad things. So Omar Akta decided that he would do the opposite, and he would make the biggest Quran ever made. It had to be brought to the palace on a, a cart because it was so big and so heavy. When he presented it to Tamerlane, the Sultan was very happy. In the thousand years since Mohammed received his first revelations, the Islamic world had grown, divided, conquered, and finally settled into three empires. The Ottomans in Turkey, the Mughals in India, the Safavids in Iran. The Safavid capital, Isfahan, was a dazzling modern city. Much of it was newly built in the 17th century, although it was a very old city. And this tile panel has a typical scene of what would have gone on there. The tile panel depicts a woman in a rather provocative pose, handing a glass of wine to a European suitor. 
Now, whether this woman was a proper lady or not a proper lady is up for discussion. But the basic idea is that La Dolce Vita was alive and well in Isfahan in the 17th century. At the Louvre, a similar panel shows a young prince and his poetry teacher engaged in a poetic joust. The prince who is educated in the art of war is also educated to write in calligraphy, to compose, first of all, poetry, and then to recite his work to his poetry master. In Persia, poetry and literature were centuries-old traditions that eventually gave rise to a new genre of painting, the art of the illustrated book. Under the Safavids, so in Iran in the 16th and 17th century, uh, the art of the illustrated book achieved new heights. These folios are from the most famous illustrated manuscript of the 16th century in Iran, the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings, made for the Safavid Shah Tahmasp. It is luxurious in every way. The absolute peak of perfection in Persian painting. Real gold and silver were used in the paintings, and other colors were made from grinding up gems and turning them into paint. There are many, many battle scenes. There are love scenes. There are encounters with witches, demons, dragons, all kinds of wonderful monsters, actually. It had over 250 illustrated pages, and one of the opening folios is this one, which shows the invention of fire. The paintings are based on the epic poem by the Persian poet Ferdowsi, written over 500 years earlier, around the year 1000. 50,000 rhyming couplets tell the tales of the ancient kings of Persia, from mythical beginnings until Persia was conquered by the Arabs in the seventh century. Some say Ferdowsi was driven by nostalgia for Persia's lost cultural identity. This manuscript represents a high point of painting in Iran. It idealized the world to the point where terrible battles and dramatic events turned into a kind of vision of loveliness almost. And this kind of painting deeply influenced the Ottomans and the Indians on both sides of Persia. In southern India, the kingdom of Bijapur closely identified with Safavid Iran. This painting shows an imaginary gathering of Bijapur's past and present rulers seated on an exquisite Persian carpet. And then you have great sweeping mountains, these pink mountains in the background with trees and vistas. The central figure sitting uh, enthroned in the middle of the painting with one foot resting on the globe is the founder of the dynasty, Yusuf and all around him on that fabulous carpet are his descendants. In fact, this covers a period of 200 years, but it also gives you a sense of how grand their vision of themselves was. In reality, Bijapur would soon fall to the relentless aggressions of the Mughal Empire to the north. Magnificent bejeweled daggers like these were part of the Mughal's courtly costume, symbols of their military might and limitless wealth. They ushered in possibly one of the most opulent eras of world art ever. Ruler after ruler uh, brought new facets to the idea of opulence, of creativity, of accomplishment. One of the most famous Mughal rulers is Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal. This is his portrait. He's in a very regal position. He is straight-backed on a horse. He is uh, haloed. He has all these martial attributes. He also has opulent patterning, opulent daggers, opulent textiles all around him to signify his great taste and the great opulent court from which he comes and the opulence for which he stands because he, of course, is the builder of the world's most opulent building. The ivory-white Taj Mahal is made of marble inlaid with precious and semi-precious stones, a perfect harmony of arches, domes, and minarets. In the central chamber, 
lie the graves of Shah Jahan and his queen. The surrounding Jali screens filter soft light, bathing them in a play of shadows and patterns. Jali means sort of a pierced screen. And um, to manipulate hard stone into lacy, porous filigree is an incredible technical achievement of the great stone cutting traditions of India, which of course go back before the Muslim period as well. This Jali is designed as a pattern within a pattern. The main part of the Jali consists of two overlapping trellises, one which is uh, made of boulder lines, and that is octagon-based. And then within that, on a kind of inner level, which is actually inside the, the bigger trellis, is a smaller pattern, a star-based pattern. And at the heart of every star, you find a small meander pattern. This little element here, this and that, this together is a meander. So it takes a lot of figuring out, and then, of course, to execute it. Islamic art would reach a zenith during the final empire of Islam as the Ottomans drew creative inspiration from throughout their expansive realm. This is the official insignia or Tugra of Suleiman the Magnificent, the greatest ruler of the Ottomans, Islam's final empire. Ribbons of ink reveal the Sultan's name and title amid watercolor fields of flowers and real gold. In the 16th century, under Suleiman's rule, the Ottoman state became a multinational, multilingual superpower. The Ottoman Empire was a huge empire, and huge parts of the world were brought together not just by uh, military conquest, political ties, all the routine ways in which an empire is held together, but also through the language of artistic expression. And you found this great unified artistic style that spread across the Mediterranean that is distinctively and uniquely Ottoman. Royal workshops produced luxury items for the court, while commercial factories in provincial centers turned out products for patrons of all types. The city of Ushak was, and still is, known for the production of carpets. Ushak carpets are particularly famous for this great medallion style that you see. You see that the central medallion is complete, but on the edges, each of the medallions has actually been cut off in half. And there's a reason for that. You create the illusion of infinite repetition. And the idea of infinity really alludes to the divine. And so there's a very high ideal uh, woven into the, the fabric, in one sense, of these carpets. The factories in Iznik produced refined ceramics with splendid designs, like this plate with a peacock surrounded by feather-like saz leaves. Et saz en turc est un mot qui a une signification assez proche de forêt enchantée, justement. Euh, donc, euh, on est vraiment dans Saz le... is a Turkish word that has a meaning close to enchanted forest. So we're really in the world of magic, of the imagination, with a peacock who is flying and walking in a forest of large serrated leaves, slightly elongated, a little swirling, which gives a swirling pattern to the entire surface of the plate. Saz leaves surround a dragon in this dynamic drawing by the celebrated artist Shah Kili. Now, he was obviously trained in the art of calligraphy, because if you look at the way the line goes on the back of the dragon, it's thick and thin, it moves like a calligraphic pen. But the dragon has real life, he has great teeth, he has great vigor in the way he moves, and all around him are these delightful leaves. Sars leaves are found on colorful Iznik tiles, like these, which still today enliven the walls of mosques and palaces throughout Istanbul. Iznik potters also catered to the pilgrimage trade, creating souvenir tiles of holy sites for travelers to set into their walls back home. This tile shows the Kaaba that holds the black stone in the holy city of Mecca. A similar tile shows the holy city of Medina, not a required stop for pilgrims, but a part of the Muslim way of life. 
One way for people to understand how people lived is to actually look at a room where they did live. This is an actual room from an 18th century nobleman's home in Damascus, Syria, a prosperous commercial center, and a main gathering place for the Hajj caravans to Mecca. The Damascus room is one of the great beloved treasures of our collection. It took us almost eight years to put this room together. In those eight years, the Metropolitan did extensive research and conservation on the smallest of details to the massive ceiling installed 20 feet above. The room has tulip designs, for example, that are very much from a period in Ottoman history when there was a great tulip rage going on. So you have these sort of delightful tulips all over. And then you also have a strong imprint of Mamluk design, where you had very powerful geometric forms and banding of a certain type and medallion-based decoration. And you see that in the ceiling. You see that in some of the wall panels as well. There is Arabic poetry around the, the cornice. And the poetry praises the house, praises the owner of the house, and praises the prophet Muhammad. In the meantime, some of the imagery on the panels on the walls is really borrowed from European sources. The Damascus Room reflects a cosmopolitan climate firmly rooted in tradition. The Ottomans were enduring, but not eternal. After World War I, their empire was divided up by the Allies. A new term emerged, the Middle East, Syria became a French mandate. In 1929, a team of French experts working with local artisans to restore the Great Mosque of Damascus made an important artistic discovery. Among the treasures of the Department of Islamic Art at the Louvre is a set of nine mosaic reproductions from the Great Mosque of Damascus. The long-lost mosaics dated to the original construction of the mosque in the 8th century. For a thousand years, the mosaics were celebrated throughout the known world until they were completely covered with plaster in Ottoman times. This not only hid them, but preserved their original colors. Photography in those days was black and white, so the team set out to make paper reproductions in color. And here we have a photograph that shows the artists executing these reproductions on small pieces of paper that were then assembled together. And if we come closer, we can see that each tessera tile of this mosaic was made one to one. So this is a beautiful reproduction. Rediscovery and discovery of a shared cultural heritage inspire the scholars who research, conserve, and curate Islamic art at the Louvre, the Metropolitan, and other great museums. Je suis profondément convaincu que l'enrichissement individuel. I am deeply convinced that personal growth comes from understanding of others. I choose to gain that insight through art, because art is what brings us closer to the depths of a civilization's personality. I believe, I really believe now, that these galleries are the antidote to Islamophobia. And even people who are set against the ideas behind these things cannot avoid being taken in, pulled in, by the beauty of the objects. Art, whether it was made centuries ago or yesterday, can be a catalyst for cultural understanding. So yes, this responsibility is enormous, but it is also a wonderful opportunity almost like a utopia to change the world. Museums can change the world. I know that's asking for a lot, but in fact, I believe it's very simple because you just have to take that first step on the path of something that's beautiful and positive and you find yourself going in that direction without too much difficulty.